today, first talk here on track two, uh, we got babies, we got puppies, we got cars, we got exercise, we got friggin' guessing games. Um, I don't know what all this has to do with selling security, but uh, homegirl Brittany here is about to tell you. So, take it away, Brittany. Make sure that this is moving. Maybe. Maybe not. So first I want to give a kind of a warning. This is going to be very participatory. So if you are not interested in participating, I will not be offended. Now it's the time to get up and move to another track where maybe um, things might be a, a little bit um, less exciting for you where you can kind of relax for your morning. So, with that being said, I first need, oh, also, if you're really scared of yelling out stupid answers, once again, another track. Um, I need someone who really is bad at whistling. <laughs> Any bad whistlers? All right, sir, you're now my whistle person. Congratulations. Anytime that you see a whistle on your screen, your job is to blow that whistle. <laughs> this is the one time to show your whistles, whistle skills. <laughs> Now I need someone that hates candy. Great. I actually had two people. Here you go, and then and gentlemen in the back. So these are our candy givers. For people that participate, you will have candy lobbed at you. Do either one of you have really, really bad athletic capabilities? We're here. I'm hoping. <laughs> back, watch behind you, someone's in front, it could be coming out from any direction. Whistleblower, you've already failed. <laughs> I, I'm bad at it. You are very bad at it. <laughs> Sir, do we need to reassign this? Well, maybe so you have any alcohol wise? No. Remember whistle that someone else used. It hasn't been used yet, but okay. All right, so it's working. Great test. All right, now we're going to test our candy throwers. For anyone, can you name a movie that has a number or a color in it? Oh, seven. Red. Red <laughs> candy people. <laughs> quote all the time. It's probably one of the best quotes. And in security, 
knowing will actually determine the success of your program. Now, I'm not talking about knowing the latest security event or the, your threat landscape or what's out there in the wild or all the details about the threat actors. Once again, we're talking the basics here. We're talking things that you signed up to protect. We're talking about things that in your daily, in your daily job, you're responsible for overseeing. So we're going to start with the game. In this game, uh, I'm going to show you some pictures, and we're going to do a countdown from five. We're going to start with number five security control and work our way up to the most important security control. So I'll show you some pictures, and your job is to guess the security control. All right. So once again, candy people, get ready. People yelling out answers, and people that are sitting by people that are yelling out answers. Watch your head. Watch your general space. Brick wall. Firewall. Firewall. <laughs> so we have a gentleman up here with some people in his hands. Management. <laughs> Management. That's a very good one. Next we have a, a gal with uh, her hands in the cookie jar. Super cute kid. Could or could not be related to me. Now we've got people with access to things. Jerks. And we've got some administrators. Very close. Oh, <laughs> is right. Privilege management is what we're talking about. So essentially tracking, um, monitoring, so preventing some things that people with advanced permissions can do on your network. And this could be a multiple system, multiple systems and locations. So step number one is to minimize and control. So what are some ways that you can minimize access? Least privilege, so only giving it when you need to get it. What about, how are some ways that you can restrict it? So I've given you privilege, right? Um, how can I restrict that access? Change all the passwords. Very good, change all the passwords. <laughs> Role based. What's that? Auditing. <laughs> I am <laughs>
kind of hanging out with you guys, needs to access on a continual basis to do his job. That should be reported, put it in your ticketing system, then you have a business reason why, which can be reviewed later. So step number three, manage devices. This is really, really strange to see under privileged management. Does anybody want to guess why devices would be with privileged management? Say that again? They get stolen. They get stolen? Different levels of access. Different levels of access? Onboarding and offboarding. So, <laughs> anytime you get a new device, they usually have default creds, right? Those default creds usually have the same levels of access as an administrator. So, as you start to pull on and off these devices, you need to go through, make sure you're not accidentally giving out administrative privileges to essentially anyone. So, and any device can have these, right? Most devices do, they have a default password, so make sure that you're checking. Next, you wanna monitor your guys that have this advanced permissions. So, know when your admins are changing. You wanna know when they're added, you wanna know when they're taken off. Anyone, guess, anyone want to guess why you care about when they're taking off? Rogue employees? Because they probably wrote a script with their admin. <laughs> <laughs> so if all of a sudden someone gets into your system and they want to be the only one that can control that system, I'm probably going to start taking off people. I'm probably going to make sure that I am the only one that can use that system. So make sure that you're reviewing that, you're getting notifications, and then periodically audit. So if you have systems that fall under some type of federal regulation, you're probably going to have to audit on a periodic basis, um, your administrators. But as a general principle, try to do it. It's a best security practice. Just get in the routine of auditing every quarter. You have the business justifications that are in your system. If someone's no longer with you, they should no longer be on that list. It's a pretty easy process to follow. Now, we want to alert on failure, meaning if the admin is continually failing, we want to be notified about it. Why do we care? Brute force? So, I feel like this is kind of a, yeah, that totally makes sense. It's, we want to know if people are just failing, failing, failing on our most sensitive accounts. But how many people are actually doing it? How many people are actually getting notified when that happens? Going back to those 90% of the companies that fail to do the five basics, this is pretty basic. If someone is ramming your system with administrative privileges over and over and over again, and you're not alerting on it, chances are they're eventually going to get there. Right? So back to basics. Best basics. And lastly, step number six is using multi-factor authentication. So what are some ways that you can multi-factor? Yubikey. Yubikey? Biometrics. Bio? Bio? Oh. <laughs> Do <laughs> Yeah, smart cards, certs, tokens, you name it, bio. Um, there's a lot of ways that you can multi-factor. But let's face it, your business is probably not going to put multi-factor on everything. And in some cases, your businesses might actually hate multi-factor. <coughs> So if for some reason you can't multi-factor um, and your admins are not going to use multi-factor to get into their systems, um, I would suggest trying to get your business to sign off on NIST standard passwords. So does anyone know the current NIST standard for passwords? Passphrase. Passphrase. 14, I heard it. Four, four. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> So 14 characters, 14 characters and change when it's compromised. Two things to note, I didn't say complexity. I didn't say uppercase, lowercase, numbers, special symbols. 14 characters. The other thing I said is change when it's been compromised. So if you have a mechanism in place that tells you when it's been compromised, great, good for you. Um, otherwise, you may need to look at when it's time that makes sense to rotate their password. If you're using something like 14 characters, you can probably get away with a year. 
One caveat on that, if you're adhering to any federal standards, they may not have updated their standards. You can talk to them about that. It's usually dependent on who's auditing you. So an auditor can have a different opinion than another auditor. So check with your auditor before you move to that if you have some federal requirements. So these are the six steps we just went over really quickly. Uh, minimize and monitor, inventory and justify, manage your devices, know who your admins are, um, make sure that you're alerting on failure, and then secure authentication. So moving on to number four. Here we go again. We see this gentleman. So it's probably not privilege, it's probably management. <laughs> All right, now we see this very, very helpless bird. Vulnerability management. I heard it already. <laughs> vulnerability management. So essentially we're identifying, assessing, or mediating vulnerabilities. Good news, half the steps in this one. Three steps. First step is to scan and correlate. So you got your automated scans. Um, I would suggest doing these every week. If you can do them more than weekly, you have an awesome team and a great group of people that are catching for you. Um, way to go. Um, once you scan and you get those reports in, you're going to hand them off to your system administrators. Why are your system administrators? They're the ones that are managing it, and they're going to be the ones that remediate it. This doesn't work this way in all the companies. Um, my opinion, it should. If you own a system, if you're responsible for maintaining that system, you're responsible for maintaining the security of the system. Our security people are responsible for reporting on security and advising and assisting where need be. Everyone should start taking ownership of their devices. My opinion. Breach. <laughs> <laughs> so, once you have your, your findings, Go back to your logs and start correlating what you're actually seeing in your traffic and look at your vulnerabilities. Are those vulnerabilities being exploited? Or is what you're seeing in your traffic correlates to some activity that you're actually seeing on your network? This is really, really hard to do. Um, for Especially if you have a small security team, you're probably not going to be able to dig in this deep. But if you have the depth um, and you have the time, because security people have so much time, Make sure, um, this is a really, really good step to take and don't actually learn a whole lot in the process. So next, and what I've seen over and over again, and it just drives me crazy, is when you're doing scanning, make sure you're doing authenticated scans. So what that means is when you scan, the account that you're using to scan the system should have credentials to see inside the system. If you can't see inside the systems, you don't know what exists on the, inside your systems. So you're not going to see software vulnerabilities. You're just going to see on the outside of your system, right? So if you're starting to look at one of these reports and you don't see any kind of software on there, that should be your first trigger of, hey, this is not a credential scan. With that being said, now we have all of these service accounts that can log on to systems. So let's revisit privilege, <laughs> privilege management. Okay, so if you have service accounts that are logging on to all these systems, you probably don't want the same account to have access to all of your systems. So start breaking up service accounts to see what they can get access to. So same thing with privilege management. You want to narrow the list of people that have access to one system. The same thing with your service accounts that are going to have access to your systems. Um, and then make sure the people that are running these tools are authorized employees. So probably handle, handle them in the same way that you would your system admins. Number two, stay current. We know that vulnerabilities change every single day. We're going to see some zero days to here. Um, so your vulnerabilities are going to change. We know this. The only way that you can be effective is by staying up to date. So what are some ways that you can stay up to date? Twitter RSS feeds. Twitter RSS feeds. Your institutional ISAC. ISAC. US CERT. US CERT. Threat Intel. Threat Intel. So there's a lot of ways that, that you can get together, collaborate, find out that information. <laughs> So you got threat intel, um, general updates with your systems, um, pulling this information and make sure that they're up to date with the latest alerts, patches, um, and so on and so forth. Make sure that you're keeping your systems essentially patched and up to date. And then lastly, once you patch, you're going to compare. So do your scan, get your vulnerability report, hand it off to that sysadmin, give him time to, to do his thing, and then on your next scan, go back and see, did it actually get patched? 
Is what you're providing them something that they can actually action on? Maybe it didn't get patched because they didn't have time. Maybe it didn't get patched because they tried it and it broke something and they had to roll back. So your job as a security professional is to get out, build that relationship, go and talk with that system administrator and understand what's going on. You may not be able to patch everything. And in those cases, you're going to take it, put it into your ticket managing system, your change management control, make sure that you have a record of that. And then go back and relook those things. Because as we know, it could be just a very low risk patch that you asked to send out. But now, three months later, new vulnerabilities have come out. And this is a very, very high risk. So you need to start talking about other controls that you can put in place there. Or maybe you have to segment them a little bit differently. So there may be a reason why they're not patching. But make sure if that is the case, that that's reported, and you are going back to relook at these things. So here's real quickly the those three we went over with. And we're going to move into control number three here. Management. We're getting good at this. Not a pro. <laughs> Con configuration management. You guys are getting pretty good at this. So essentially we're going to look at the way our systems are configured here. Um, this could be anything on pretty much any server or device that you have just to kind of prevent exploitation of the way that the system is set up. So the first thing you want to do is, this is kind of obvious, is set your standard. Determine what that standard is going to be and then use it. When you build that image, use that image. Um, You'll have to go back. We already talked about vulnerabilities. Vulnerabilities change. You'll have to relook and make sure that you're updating that image. There's a, a whole lot of um, prescription on how often you should do this. But for me, the best answer is know your business, know what your risks are, and make some make a decision based on what makes sense for your company. Okay? Um, don't try to force something because then this will never happen. So. Your image breaks some stuff when you start to roll it out. What do you do? Fix your image. Okay, you fix your image. It breaks like 10%. Tell them to submit a ticket. Submit a ticket. <laughs> Document it. Document it. Exactly. The same thing that you would do with vulnerabilities. You're going to take it, figure out what's wrong with it. If there's additional controls that we need to do to put in place there, great. We'll do a security exception, and then we'll go back and audit it. So same thing that you're doing for your vulnerability management, you're doing here. Next, you want to do some file integrity and monitoring. Um, that's FEM. So store your master images somewhere that's safe and secured, and you want to do some file integrity stuff on that. If you are giving out an image to every device in your company, you want to make sure that that image has good integrity, that those files can be trusted that when you're rolling them out. So once you have your image and you're using your image, make sure your image is clean and it doesn't change. You also may want to do this if you have any critical files that everyone's using that's across the business. Um, once again, if you get into some federally um, regulated data, you may have to do this on, on those systems anyway. So what are some things that you think that you should look for in a film report? Say that again. Checksums, hash. Cryptographic sign. Crypto signage. So I was looking maybe a little bit more high level. Um, I'm looking for any unusual changes versus routine changes. So if you know that something is happening on that system, you're patching on the system, that would be something that would be expected. You could probably try that, tie that back into a change management report, right? You knew something was going to happen, it changed, and you have a record that it was supposed to change. Um, you could look for permission changes, owner changes. Um, you would, it would be nice if you could see who's making these changes and look at that over time as you're moving forward. So you can see if they're actually valid changes or something's messing up. Next are configuration checks. So this is another tool that you're going to need to have. It's essentially going to go out and make sure that your system is set up like you think it should be. Um, usually uh, GPOs for Windows is used here. Um, for Unix systems, you may want to use something like Puppet. 
Ideally, it's going to go out, it's going to set your configurations, it's going to go back and check the configurations every so often, change them, or it can push them manually. So if you have a standard, it's pushing it, it's updating it. And this is the last one for this control, configuration management, um, is remote access. This one is, is pretty easy. You're probably going to need to access all these systems remotely. You're probably not going to have people running all over the place. So when you are reaching out and talking to the systems, make sure you're just doing it over secure channels. Don't use RDP over something that's wild and free. Use a TLS connection, SSL, um, something that's going to provide you some encryption as you're moving forward. So here's the top four that we have, kind of hard to see, but establishing a standard, do your FEM checks, do your config checks, and then check for remote access. That was really long. That was kind of hard. Kind of hard. All right, so we're going to take a break. We quickly went through three. We've got two more left, um, but you've been sitting in your seat a while, so why not get moving? So here's how we're going to do this. You will stand up if you have ever done these things. If they do not pertain to you, sit back down. Everyone understand the rules of the game? Aye, aye, Captain. Woo-hoo, let's get going. Have you ever been called to fix your parents or grandparents' computer? <laughs> nice. Props to the people sitting. <laughs> <laughs> Have you got into your family's or friend's social media account and posted something on their behalf? Sit down and get that one. Have you ever gotten to your ex's social media account? I won't ask what you did or That's what you did. Don't sit down. <laughs> this is recorded. Have you ever prank called someone? I was pretty sure this was going to show your age, but I've seen some younger people out there. I'm impressed. Have you ever clicked on a phishing email? Hell no. Just won't admit it. People that are sitting down, you are liars. You're a liar, you're a liar. And maybe you're very, just very, very honest. <laughs> Have you ever insisted that you needed more privileges than you really needed? Oh, yes. Maybe yes. to downplay something? Liars. I don't need domain. Have you ever quit a job? Like Burger King or like a real job? <laughs> Have you ever planted a random beeping device in your office? <laughs> so this is, if you haven't done this, this is amazing. Especially if you're in a military operation and you want 24-hour ops. It's fantastic. Have you ever told your boss no? Woo! Have you ever installed malware just to see what happens? Totally not. Oh, you the whole lab. It's fun. Yes. Have you set? Have you ever sent your password over email or text to your friend? I've totally had to do this, and then I've changed my password. But had to. Have you ever told someone to turn it off and back on again? It's even better when you have to say, "Are you sure it's plugged in?" Have you ever accidentally bricked your computer? Oh, I'm proud to see the number of people standing. I've done this. My child has actually done full disk encryption on my computer, and she's in one, so that was amazing. <laughs> Have you ever physically assaulted a computer or network device? <laughs> All right, you guys are my people. All right, take a seat. <laughs> All right, game over. So we got a little bit of blood going again. Um, we can get back in action and answer some questions. So quick recap. These are the top five that we've gone over, privilege management, vulnerability, and configuration management. So moving on to number two. Ooh. Inventory management. Oh, this gentleman knows. Um, inventory of software. So essentially, it's exactly what it says. So step number one. What should be on your software inventory list? Mine, sweeper. <laughs> <laughs> Authorized, unauthorized, authorized software. Anything else that you would like to do with that? Yeah, that's one map. And map. So we're listing a lot of a lot of software. So we agree, software should be on the list. Uh, development owners. Development owners. So if you have owners that are associated associated with that piece of software, great. Um, versions 
of software is very, very good to have so you know if you're up to date. Um, if you have a critical type of software, we should absolutely have FIM around that. This list of software doesn't necessarily have to have FIM on it. Um, if you're securing it somewhere, if that's important to you. Um, but if you actually have a piece of software that is critical, make sure that does have FIM. All right, step number two. This is a sore subject for some people and probably unrealistic for a lot of companies. So where it makes sense, whitelist. I understand that your business is probably not going to be able to whitelist all applications across their business, but if you can in specific areas, whitelist where you can, it will make your life a lot easier. Step number three is visibility. So use software inventory tools. If you're doing this by hand, you're probably missing a lot of things, the same thing you are with admins. Use a software tool that can help you out with this, and you want to tie your software to your hardware when you can. So why do you think it's important to tie your software to your hardware? Say that again. Fixes. Fixes. Mm -hmm. So location, you know where it is, you can do system patching. What if you have a device that's unencrypted that's lost? It would probably be handy to know what type of software that they would have on that system. So when you can, tie it to your hardware. And next, air gap. What does air gap mean? Not connected. So essentially there's a break between the machine and the rest of the network. It's usually not on the network um, and it's not touching anything else. These are where you want to have your very high risk systems. So not in a location where everyone can access these. So here are the four quick things that we went over for software inventory. We're going to roll quickly on to number one. Inventory. Hardware. Oh. All right. So once again, back to automated tool to do this. If you're a, two, a teeny tiny company, maybe you can do it by hand. Um, but that's usually just really unrealistic to do. Um, when you're using this tool, if you guys have, are using DHCP, you probably are. Um, make sure it can do DHCP server logging because else you're going to throw it off. And you also want to make sure that it's detecting unknown systems. Um, a lot of software will be able to give you some hints about what it is, so you can go back and verify. But chances are you probably have a lot of stuff out there that you don't know what it is. Once you have that list, inventory. So what goes on your inventory list for your devices? Organizationally owned assets. Org owned assets? <laughs> 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 the machine name, if you have that, any kind of network addresses that may be associated with that machine. Um, if you have an owner, include that. And other things that are very, very helpful is noting whether that system, if you allow personal devices, so that's on your network, if it's a personal device, or if it's portable, so you know it's easy to go missing. Would you include IoT devices? Absolutely. Uh, the question was, would you include IoT devices? Um, I absolutely would. Woo! That goes flying. Um, in this tool that's pulling in all your hardware, it's super advantageous if you can get a tool that automatically updates and lets you know when it finds new equipment. Did I jump? No. Okay. So restrict access. Keep all the devices off of the network. So if they're not authorized to be on your network, don't allow them on your network. How do we do that? Nah. Nah. So certificates or 802.1x, um, something that says you do not have the authorization to be on your network and not allow it. So that was for the three, visibility, inventory, and restrict. So we've quickly gone over the security basics. Um, gonna review them real quick. So the top two and the most important are your inventory, your software and your devices. I like to say when they come together, they make that zero and that's your goal. Zero unknowns on your network. I also sign on the two strongest fingers that are on your network. And the last three are all about management. You can't manage what you don't know. And that's why software and hardware inventories are, are so important, right? So if you can get these five things, this basically gets your business to an okay standpoint, right? 
This is the key. So now you know your basics, and you've explained that to your company, right? And this is what happens, no budget. Um, maybe the company doesn't really understand your version of security or your vision. Um, maybe that you're just not using your white, the right words. You need to get someone to fund this program, right? We know the five basics, but companies aren't doing the five basics, and companies are getting breached. So how do we educate? How do we influence? How do we start to sell security? A lot of us sell security by doing this. We talk about it, and we say it over and over again, and we yell it, and we get to the point where it's like, I told you to do it. If you don't want to do it, it's fine. If you get breached, I told you to do it. But that doesn't sell your program. That doesn't make your company any safer. This guy makes your company safer. This is the likable guy that gets people to turn and look. Have you ever had someone bring their little kid into the audience? I mean, to the office? And all of a sudden, people start standing up over cubicles and looking, going, oh, it's so cute. This is what you need to be. You need to understand the art of influence. So that's what we're going to go over here. There's actually five principles of influence. The first is being likable. Everyone loves puppies. And our puppy, I mean, what do you have to do to be likable? Is it just likable like a puppy? Um, I actually pulled this picture from a Popular Science article last year, um, around October 16th. And the title of this Popular Science article was, Puppies are the culprits behind a 12-state diarrhea disaster. <laughs> Puppies are so likable that they can spread this over 12 states. That's how likable puppies are. So what do you have to do to be likable? There's actually two characteristics to likability. Uh, the first is being similar, and the second one is being familiar. So having common interest and having a common presence. Have you ever worked with someone where they show up, you send them an email, and you get like a gift back? And you're like, is that a yes? Is that a no? Is that a, I have no idea what you're talking about? And it can get kind of annoying. Um, and then after a while, they start sending some pretty funny gifts and you find yourself laughing. Every now and then you may respond with a gift. And then you get someone new and they're like, yeah, I talked to Jane. I sent her a thing, she just sent me back a gift. And you're like, <laughs> yeah, that's Jane. Jane has just become likable. Because she's found a common interest, you guys are sharing the same type of gifts now, and you're interacting with her over and over. So when you're going out, you're talking your security talk, be relatable, and then go back and talk to them again and again and again. The second principle is scarcity, which sounds pretty weird. But this is how in the fashion industry you can sell shoes for $2,500, or buy a Louis Vuitton bag for 55 k but maybe shoes and purses aren't your thing. Maybe it's this nice Bugatti, 2.9 mil. You're the only one. There's only one of you in the area that has one of these, right? It's very exclusive. That's the idea of scarcity. That's how they influence you to buy. Now, this isn't just particular to big dollar items. We see this when we're going out traveling, right? And we're looking, oops, there's only a couple more left at this price or a few seats left. Or maybe I wanted that rug, and that's a really horrible owl, but uh, there's only a couple left. That might be a good gag. Scarcity. Use this to your advantage whenever you're talking about your security things. You could say that, hey, this is what the really cutting edge companies are doing. Or I'm giving you this information because you're the person that I trust with this information. You're making the source of exclusivity. They feel important. The business can feel important. Next is reciprocity. I kind of wanted to make sure that we don't confuse this with quid pro quo. Quid pro quo is, is if you go out and buy me a car, I'll give you a raise. Reciprocity is the idea is if you do something good for me, I'm going to want to do something good for you. So if someone's coming by my desk every Thursday to pick up my trash on their way to the trash bin, and then one Thursday they aren't there, when I go to take out my trash, I go, I should probably go over there and grab their trash bag. It's that feeling of obligation because they've done something nice for you. I don't know if anybody got these in the mail, but they're surveys. These showed up at my house. They're like, go online, here's a $1 bill. When I first got them, I was like, ooh, should I just throw this away with a 
$1 bill, like I feel really bad about taking this $1 bill and not doing anything in return for the $1 bill. And then I thought of this, I'm like, these people are trying to, to influence me. They're trying to get over on me. Thank you for this $1 bill and I threw them away. <laughs> but this is the idea of reciprocity. They've given you a $1 bill, so now you feel obligated to do something in turn for them. So, moral of the story is, get out when you're meeting people. If you can, help them out. Show them a tip. Maybe there's some security tool that you know of that might help them save passwords. Whatever you're doing, maybe their kid's doing something that's kind of off the wall, give them a piece of advice. Because they're going to want to return that favor when they can. Next is consistency. This can be very, very influential. If you think about going, if you have a friend that you go out to the movies to all the time, you know that they may or may not show up. Then you have a friend that always shows up, they usually text you when they're on their way. If you have a problem, who are you going to? It's the person that you know that you can depend on. So when you're saying, if you're giving answers that are consistent and based on some sort of fact, your actions and your answers just need to be consistent. So for those people that said no to their boss, hopefully you were basing it on something that was consistent, a policy that was in place. When people go to you, they need to know that they can get a fair shake. You're not just gonna say no. You're gonna listen to them and understand what their problem is and make a decision based off of that. And then lastly, this is social proof. This to me is the most powerful tool. This is the idea that we make decisions based on what we see other people doing. And you can see this in children, right? This is how they learn. This is how they grow. This is how the fashion industry spreads. All of a sudden, people start showing up in high-waisted pants, and i got to go get a pair of high-waisted pants. But we also see this. Have you ever gone to a restaurant, you got your food, you sit down, you're starting to finish it up, and you start thinking, do I leave it here on the table? Do I, is there a place where I'm supposed to go and drop off my food before I leave? What do I do? So you start watching other people, right? And you do what they do. This is the idea of social proof. So if you can get one person to buy into your idea, and then another person to buy into your idea, once you get that culture going, other people will naturally follow what they see. And that's the idea of social proof. So you have your principles of influence, right? We talk about likability, which is being familiar, having similar interests, um, scarcity, reciprocity, you do something for me, I'm going to want to do something for you. And this idea of consistency, and finally, social proof. Making decisions based off of what you see other people doing. So, we know the five basics. We went over the five basics. They're not easy. Some of that stuff we, we went through and we're like, oh yeah, I absolutely know that. But are you doing it? Can you do it? This is what companies fall from each year. So you know the five basics. You talk to your company. Now it's time for you to become that influencer that can sell your security plan. So that's all I have for today. Um, please rate the conference. Please rate this group. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, ma'am. It's really more of a comment. Um, but back to that likability, we need to stop labeling our users as losers or stupid because it's not their full-time job to be security people. And we've gotten to the habit of, oh God, they're so stupid, they clicked on that phishing link. Their job is to open resumes if they're in the HR department. So we need to, we need to start being better at how we treat the end users in security. And I think this this goes a long way to helping shape those. Um, so yes, I enjoyed this and I just wanted to throw that comment out there. So there's actually two things I wanna know about that. Absolutely likability, you're creating relationships, right? You're learning that throughout your business, uh, which is how you influence. Uh, the second is as a security professional, your job is to secure the company. And if you don't know what the business does, if you don't know what the person in HR does, if you don't know what your guy in tax or contract is doing, what he has to do every day to do his job, 
you don't know how to protect it. So that's why those, building those relationships are so important um, in understanding your business. Anything else? I got one for you, actually. Sure. So neither of us are in a position to say whether or not NIST is correct in their new recommendations, but I don't know about y'all's users, uh, but ever since that NIST recommendation, the password change recommendation came out, oh, my users love telling me how complexity's done. I shouldn't have to have an uppercase and a number and a bot, and that's fine because NIST did release that publication. If nothing else, I think I should be happy that at least my users, you know, are paying attention to that. I guess what I am curious to pick your thoughts on are, let's be real, a lot of our users have given the option, they're going to choose all lowercase letters, and it'll be long, which is good, but consider that we're in a world where Bitcoin mining rigs are somewhat regular and commonplace right now. Um, I. I guess I have trouble thinking that there shouldn't be a rotation time on these passwords, because the whole reason why we have rotation time in the first place is to prevent a, an offline password cracking attack. I feel like if your hash cap mask is going to be you know, all lowercase letters, your cracking time could be very reasonable on a Bitcoin mining rig. So mm, I guess A, what are your thoughts on that? And B, what can we do when we know that our environment may not be conducive to that NIST recommendation based on you know this, that, or the other thing. Okay, so your first one, I'm gonna get a, a little bit mathy on you. So you're right, if you're only using lowercase letters, your entropy is going to be a lot smaller. The smaller your entropy, the easier it is to crack. Um, with that being said, you probably will have some password crackers that are saying, hey, I'm just gonna use lowercase or I'm gonna use upward and lowercase. And that's a little bit of education there. Like I mentioned, if you don't know when your password's been compromised, then it's hard to change it when it's been compromised, right? So you have to come up with something that makes sense. So if you're having a very high entropy password, and it's long, and it's using multiple characters, then look at that. You can crunch numbers. You can run them against entropy checkers. Figure out how long it actually takes to crack that password and pick something a little bit slower, <laughs> a little bit lower. Um, I would suggest a year. If, if you're having 14 and you're having high entropy, I, I would suggest a year. And then your question around if your business won't support a new standard password, some businesses will accept that risk. Um, I've told my company, my job is not to make you the most secure company in the world. My job is to educate you on security. I'm gonna let you know about security, what I think that your security posture is, I'm going to tell you the risk around that, and my risk is to pass that off to the business. If the business chooses to accept that risk, if that's their risk tolerance, then that's what the business has chosen. They can make a decision at that point. Boom, boom, boom. Oh man, hold up. I get the mic to you. Look what you tell me. Go back to that first slide that showed all the organizations right before you showed the breach. Sure. So say you're the CISO at a company and you're doing your job, you're selling security, you're trying really hard, and then the CEO points to that slide, and he says all these companies had a breach, and while they may have sustained some temporary devaluation, none of them went out of business, none of them lost any money long term, why should I care about any of this? Yeah. How do you approach that? So, I would approach that, because there's a lot more than just monetary loss, right? There's, there's absolutely monetary loss. There's loss to the brand. And if your CEO is saying, hey, I'm okay if we get breached and we lose all our money and people don't trust us anymore, that's your company, sir. That's your company. If you don't feel okay with that as a security person and accepting that risk, go somewhere else. Can I add class action lawsuits to follow? Sure. So he's talking about class action lawsuits. If you have multiple users that are exposed, those can get pretty pricey and bring down your business quickly. So Mike, can you go back to your five different areas? I have a couple of questions around that. Uh, for the five principles of security? Yes. So I noticed that you didn't have cloud and vendors, which is an interesting, I'll call it change, especially in the cloud service area. Were you looking at cloud falling into the software area? So, cloud, same thing, vulnerability management. All of these principles apply to wherever you have data. Remember 
or in Pocophilia? All of these apply. All those apply. Okay. All those apply. And your vendors would be the same. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. When I'm assessing a vendor, I'm looking at these things and what they're doing in their environment. Okay. All right. So everybody is getting ready to transition off to uh, your next track. You want to take yep. us out for us? Hey, give it up for Brittany real quick, guys. You're going to be hanging around after the fact if anyone's got other questions. People can talk to you at the con.